You have to do it because you love it, not for this dream of you want to be a startup millionaire. Because if you want to be a millionaire, you're better off taking a high paying job and investing. You have to do this because you're passionate about it. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Innovation City. Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring innovators, disruptors, and creators who are breaking through the status quo to change the way business happens today. These are exciting times. My name is Michael Johnson. I'm here with my co-host, Tyler Kelly, and we are super excited today to have Ben Mises with us. Ben, thank you for being here. Happy to be a part of it. So this is this is going to be a great show, guys. Ben is uh, the founder of Clever Real Estate. Clever lets home sellers list their home with a full service agent and save on commission. I think right now it's just a flat three thousand dollars. Yeah, it's a flat fee of three thousand if the home is less than three hundred fifty thousand, and if it's more than that, our partner agents do one percent. That uh, that's just like outrageous. <laughs> and you're in all fifty states. Yes. And you also in like your side hustle is uh, a company that you founded with another guy called Arch Buyers. And you're basically like improving St. Louis by restoring and maintaining neglected real estate. And so, wow, like all these amazing things like on the realty side. Yeah, it's been uh, the past couple of years of my life have turned uh, more and more towards real estate and it's been a lot of fun. So I, I think the interesting thing about real estate if is if there's any industry that needs disrupted or could be disrupted, I think real estate is that industry. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you there, kind of on both sides of buying and selling. And then in terms of the local market, it's really important that we get our landlords actually maintaining the real estate and viewing it more as providing a home for the residents than an annuity that'll pay you cash every month. So how did you how did you get into real estate to start with? So it was pretty random for me. I've been working in tech since I was 18, uh, selling very various services. I graduated college. I actually took a job at a uh, different real estate startup. I was mostly building a product for uh, the big single family REITs who were buying $50 billion of single family rentals. And after helping them, building a platform for them, I kind of got curious about this is what they were buying. And I looked in my backyard and kind of realized I can do way better numbers than they're doing if I buy in St. Louis. And that started my quest of learning, getting into investing. I bought my first four family home and moved in. And right after I bought it, the company I was working at fired the entire office. And I had this huge passion for real estate. I'd run startup companies before, I'd raised VC money, and I knew this was something I had to do. I couldn't go back to work for a normal W-2 job when I had this great idea and this passion for something. I had to kind of go for it. That's amazing. So with that experience, like what's the next step? Like what was the next step that you took like to was clever like immediately in your mind or was there a process to get there? So it was a pretty quick transition to start it, but we didn't want to spend a lot of money. I brought on my uh, longtime friend and co-founder, Jeremy Decker. He's out in Australia. He's a marketing guru. We uh, built a couple landing pages, started testing the idea. And when clients came in and wanted to work with us, we realized we really had something, something here. And I kind of took all of my, the people I'd met in the past five years and saw how I could bring people to the table. Everyone was working for equity. No one was making any money. And as it grew and we got more and more clients and started becoming profitable, it's kind of spiraled out of control from there. And it started really small, more of a test. Is this going to work? And now it's just growing faster than we can handle. Now, when you say everyone, how many people were, have, were involved at that like initial stage, those initial stages? At the early stage, it was uh, myself and another friend on the phone, Jeremy out in Australia, and one of my good buddies from Bloomington who worked with me at my last company doing design. So we were a team of four or five working part time. We all had jobs just seeing what would happen. I was taking consulting gigs to pay the bills and just seeing if this idea would work. And then when it started working, we all, as many of us as we could, went full time and kind of devoted everything to the business. That's awesome. So for people out there that, you know, they're like, I have a pretty good idea. I could do something crazy like this. Like what, what would you, you know, most people want to get paid, but in reality, if you're going to be a startup and do what you need to do, like you need to do it when you can outside of normal working hours. Is that kind of what your advice would be for somebody getting started? 
Yeah, and I think there's this this big kind of myth that you need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of venture capital, you need to build this whole product. And I would argue it's exactly the opposite. We spent $99 for a subscription to a landing page service. I built it myself and we spent $30 on marketing. And you should be thinking about how little money can you spend to prove your idea and keep proving it out in stages with as little as you can. And only once you've seen people want this, I'm struggling to keep up with demand, then spend the resources and spend the time to improve it. But you don't want to spend that first. And that, I love that advice bit because what you're saying is prove the concept before you actually build the software. Yeah, and unfortunately, my first company, I, I made the opposite mistake. We raised $300,000 of venture capital. We built a product. We did get to 50,000 users, but ultimately we didn't have product market fit and we failed pretty spectacularly. And ever since then, I kind of refuse to spend a lot of money to build something if I don't know it's actually needed. As you go through that process, like how, what are some specifics on how you can test an idea you've got? Like how do you, how do you test that to find out if it's got viability in a market? Yeah, so there's a couple different things you can do. It depends on what product you're building. But if it's a service business, even if you're building some kind of tech that automates a job for someone, if you build a landing page and get someone to sign up, you might be able to offer the product if you just do all of the work yourself. It obviously won't scale, but if you can provide that value, someone will pay you for it, and you can see, man, if I just built the software that did what I'm doing for this client, I could scale it you'd be on a much better track than thinking I should build the software and then try and sell it because you might build something no one wants and waste time and money. And it's just a very risky endeavor. So you mentioned like the landing page service that you, that you got, was that just to generate leads? Like just to get like a call to action for more information or? or? Yeah, we were doing it for this company for clever. We would just get their information and then we would explain them the model over the phone and do everything else just over the phone and in person. And obviously, as we've grown, we're building out a platform to take more of it online so our team isn't as involved. But at the very beginning, it was just one landing page, and then we would call you and see if it was a good fit and do everything over the phone. I want to go back to that moment when you start when you had the idea specifically for for clever real estate. Like, what was that process like? And was there was there some moment where there was this huge need or aha moment, or was it more like I've researched a market and I think this is a good fit and like this will make us a lot of money. What did that process look like? It was kind of the culmination of having been in real estate for a decent amount of time. I kind of learned about it from the tech standpoint, then I'd sold it to these big companies, and then I'd bought myself. And I was when I was buying, I was had many, many Excel spreadsheets. We were modeling countless deals, seeing how we could exit. And it just seemed crazy after I bought this building. Like, my agent, I found the property online. I told him I want to offer on it. I told him the price we offered on it, and he didn't really do that much. And then I talked to a lot of my friends, and anyone who'd bought a home kind of had the same experience. They found it online, or they sold a home, the agent put it on the internet, and it got offers. And it just seemed ridiculous that the internet has fundamentally changed how we buy and sell homes, but it hasn't actually changed the commission structure. And it just seemed like it was ripe for disruption. So when I bought my home, and I've, I've only owned one home, I've been in my home, I think like 16 or 17 years. Wow. But uh, I remember like getting in the realtor's car and driving around and looking at homes like all day, right? And I know that was like a major burden on the realtor, especially if I didn't buy like soon. So you kind of had this like urgency to buy because I mean if, if you're empathetic at all like you feel like man I'm wasting this dude's gas yeah <laughs> like driving around town uh, but so you talk about like the real estate market in 16 or 17 years has completely changed like that's just not really how it is anymore or it's, maybe it could be better it's more common now that you would send a list these are the 10 homes I found on Zillow I would like to see them and then you would go look at those homes and if it's in a hot market, they'll generally say, you know, you need to offer full price or close to it or someone's going to buy the home out from under you. So there isn't as much. You still need an agent to help you with some of the inspections and the contracts and the paperwork. So they still have value. But the amount of value that they're supplying isn't justifying the commission they're receiving. And so like Clever Real Estate, are you partnering with realtors or no? Yeah, so we actually work with agents from almost every major brand who have signed up on our platform because we believe you don't need to make the same amount of commission that you used to, but the average home buyer who only does this once every 10 years or so, they don't need 
they, they still need help, but they don't want to pay the full commission. So we make it, it's very important to get them with an agent who's going to help them and do a great job and advise them. But it's not worth the same 3% to list it like it used to be. I like that. That sounds like a good model. I mean, what I really like is the tagline on your homepage. Did you come up with that or, or the guy out in Australia? I or did you hire an agency? Because, you know, Michael and I run an agency. And so, like, when I read that tagline, I'm like, this is, like, grade A copywriting. So I've done a lot of cold emailing. That's where I got kind of my start in tech was doing big kind of Fortune 500 sales from cold email. And we didn't really have the money for an agency. So we kind of kind of brainstormed it together. We used to have something that mentioned just the flat fee, and then we kind of realized we wanted to go to the 1% model, so it kind of came up. We do work with an agency. Our CTO actually runs a very successful agency in Australia, and he brings his development team to help us build the site. But the uh, copywriting and a lot of the content, that's all done in-house. So what do, you, what do you foresee like the future being in the real estate market? Like what's, not necessarily the market, but, but the business itself, like where is this all headed? If I was a betting man, I would bet that in the next 20 years, the 6% commission is going to be gone. And I know there's a lot of companies who are betting on building all of this AI and all of this technology to automate everything. And I just don't think that'll stick. Your home is so expensive. Even if a machine could do a better job than a human at giving you advice, you still want to hear someone who does this every day give you advice about your home which is why I think what we're building is what the market really wants. Not as expensive as it used to be, but at the end of the day, you still want an experienced agent telling you, this is the right price, or we should make this offer, this is a good deal, you won't get burned. And I think it's really hard to get away from that. As you're starting to buy something that you're only buying once every seven years, the most important decision you make, it's very tough for the average consumer to want that to be totally in the hands of a machine. So what are some of the challenges you face just as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a co-founder? like from that initial early stage to now, outside of financing and funding, obviously, but like just day-to-day -day people, business, market challenges that you face. I think the hardest thing about running any company is getting good people to join you, join you on your mission. And it does come back a bit to financing. We haven't raised as much money as some competitors, so we can't offer the huge salaries to get really the best people. So you have to convince someone, really, why you want to join the cause, come with me on this mission to make a change. And it's very difficult. You need people you can count on going up against massive competitors who have 100 times the money and 100 times the staffing. So your people need to be really high output. They need to be working together, and they need to be kind of on the same team working as one unit if you're going to even be able to compete with the bigger companies. How do you make that pitch to the people? I mean, I, from your bio, from your history, it sounds like you're pretty good at making that pitch to investors. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you make that pitch to potential employees? I found it's even easier to kind of get an employee on board because you'll just tell them what you're working on and it's really about selling the passion. One of the better things with Clever is not only do you get to work at a real estate startup, it's also run two of our board members are real estate investors, myself included. So we're not only giving you a great place to work to change kind of the industry, we're also teaching you how to invest in real estate, which is ultimately giving them the path to financial freedom. So it's kind of an empowering thing. You can leave your corporate job, do a company where you have a voice, you have a say, and at the same time, we'll teach you how to be financially free through real estate. And it's a really, really empowering value proposition. Even if we're $10,000 less than what our employees could make at a corporate job, we'll make up for it on what they teach them and the ability they'll have to make an impact. So what you're really trying to do is long-term equip people so they can avoid that situation that you had so many years ago. Yeah, I'm really big on kind of financial freedom and financial education. I think Clever is a great opportunity to give people a great place to work while also teaching them, here's real estate, here's how you can use it to reach your goals and become financially free. So you mentioned like the other guys out there with a whole lot more money than you do, that, that you have. What, uh, like how do you go up against those types of, of companies, those types of apps or you know services i think the one thing that we have as startup founders is our ability to work and our ability for small teams to cut through the bureaucracy we can dream up a system we can work all night on it all day and get it built 
Whereas the big company has meetings, they have to hire countless teams, they have to audit everything, and we can just go for it and see if it works. So it's kind of the nimbleness and the ability. There's no one else that we're reporting to. There's not as much at risk, so we're really in a position where we can go for it. So we talked a little bit about, I mean, obviously, like every startup founder is going to have, you know, unless they're rolling, rolling in it, they're going to have a funding challenge. And then we talked about like people challenges. What other like just day to day challenges do you like run into that people that are out there in your position may or may not have run into yet or just maybe they're in it right now. They don't know how to get through it. I think one thing that no one wants to talk about when it comes to running startups is just how hard these people are working. It's the only job where you can say you're working 14 hours. I was actually having a conversation with another founder. I think it was two weeks ago. I asked him how much he worked. He said he worked 14 hours, and he had to qualify that with some days I actually work 18 because he was embarrassed to tell me as a founder he only worked 14 hours. So there's a lot of stress. There's definitely uh, a lot of founders have some, you know, a little bit of mental health issues. It's an incredibly stressful job, and there's not that many people you can talk to about here's what I'm building, I'm working, you know, 18 hours a day on this. There's only a few people who can relate to that. So it can be a very lonely job in in that sense that you feel like you have to get it done. And some of the ways to make up and compete with the bigger companies is just to outwork them. Yeah. Uh, I think we can relate just to being entrepreneurs. You know, we don't develop software, but no one works harder than, than you do when you're at the top of the of the ladder per se, you know? I'm sure for your agency, if you've got a client with a deliverable and the team is off work, it's it's on you to do it and hit the deadline. Totally, yeah. And that means you're up working all night and then coming to work in the morning with a smile on your face like you don't want to fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, there's there's reward there. And sometimes, like, people see uh, how far, you know, we've come, how far you've come. Yeah. And they're like, man, I want to do what Ben's doing. But what they don't see are all those hours, all those nights, you know, all all those like failed relationships. I'm not putting that on you, but just in general, right? Like all that, all those mental health challenges. They don't see all that. They just see like where you are now. They're like, that's what I want. But it it takes a lot to get to that point. It's a lot of sacrifice. And unfortunately, a lot of times you put in all this work and your company still fails and you probably could have done better working in the corporate world. So you really... You have to do it because you love it, not for this dream of you want to be a startup millionaire. Because if you want to be a millionaire, you're better off taking a high paying job and investing. You have to do this because you're passionate about it. That's great advice. Uh, I mean, this is really cool stuff. And so with like arch buyers, you're, you're approaching the market in a completely different way. Are you actually getting your hands dirty or are you just like doing the planning? Like tell me like how involved do you get with, so with my, those renovations? My kind of philosophy on business, if you're leading a company, you need to know how to do every single role. And I think I got that. I first heard of that mentality. My uncle was one of the VPs at Taco Bell. And before they let him go into the corporate office, he spent six months in the restaurant doing every single job. And I heard him speak so highly of that, how he understood the business. And I knew if I was going to get into real estate and really manage these rehabs, I had to know what I was doing. We were going to get taken advantage of. So for our first unit, we did all of the painting. We learned how to do drywall. We did all of the plumbing. We did the electrical, a lot of the, um, the tiling. And it was terrible. It's, we live there now. It's, <laughs> we call it the learner unit. When you compare wow. it to the other three that we eventually hired out, it is, it's bad. But Like shoddy work or? A combination of shoddy work because we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. And we would do something and make a mistake and kind of think, well, next time I won't do that. But, I mean, it's been done. But it's the best work we've ever done because for all the other units I now know, this is how long it takes, this is how long it should cost, here's how I would do it or how I wouldn't do it. And it allows us to be confident to walk into a building now and say, this is what's wrong with it, this is what it needs to get done. And it's even now, here's the people I want to call to give me a bid before we go any farther in negotiations. And I don't think we would have gotten the confidence to do a deal like that and to move forward if we didn't have a base of knowledge ourselves. The, that's awesome advice like to anyone out there that wants to get into flipping property uh, at one point I tried the whole you know I, I was like a big Robert Kiyosaki fanboy mm-hmm. and so I tried the whole flipping property thing unfortunately it was right like at a downturn oh, in the, the, the account like I bought at the height and 
it did it all crash and i was like i'm stuck with this property in an undesirable part of town that is not going to move like for the next 10 years that's unfortunate um, but what you what you said was really key had i known back then that like you get like all those estimates and all yeah. that like work like pre-planned before you make an offer like th- that would have been like life-changing for me <laughs> and it's it sounds good when I say it, but there's still a lot of times we walked into that house and we're like, oh man, I have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing. Why is sewage flowing out into all the sinks? And there were some really, really rough experiences. We've had some instances with bad tenants that wanted to leave. We've had a sewage blow up all over our floor. We've had roof damage from a hailstorm. Things we're just not prepared to deal with. You kind of have to figure it out or else it'll <laughs> cause a major catastrophe. Well, uh, in my experience, like one of the things that I learned is that never buy, especially when you're doing it yourself, never buy property in a part of town that you won't visit after dark. Um, I learned that lesson the hard way because I was only able to be over there a few hours a day. Yeah, <laughs> that's some good advice. <laughs> uh, no, but that's, that's great. I, I mean, I love all the stuff you do with the arch buyers and cl- clever real estate. I mean, I think it's on the verge of blowing up and obviously there's uh, investors and like uh, accelerators, right? That mm-hmm. believe the same. I mean, you've got some backing with Clever Real Estate. Yeah. Like who's all, like what's the bigger sort? Like who's all involved with getting you to where you need to be? So it started out, we raised our first really small around a $10,000 investment from uh, Raj Niyogi. He's taken two companies public. He was working on kind of a home management app and that was kind of, after we took his initial 10,000, we haven't funded it anymore ourselves. We got uh, Capital Innovators involved. They took a chance on us. We were about two and a half months old when we got in. And since then, we've raised from some really kind of experienced investors. Uh, Bill Donius, he's uh, known in St. Louis. He took Pulaski Bank Public for $1.4 billion and just various other groups of angels, either in Austin or in St. Louis. So there's uh, a lot of fairly prominent and successful investors who are backing us in addition to the VCs from Capital Innovators. So it's enough mentorship. If we have an issue, there's someone I can call for advice. And it's uh, made it a lot easier for us to execute, knowing there's people we can count on and we're not sure what to do. And for the people uh, outside of St. Louis that don't know, like, tell us what Capital Innovators is. So Capital Innovators, they're similar to the accelerators you might have heard about, your Y Combinator to your 500 startups. They invest a small amount of money in a decent amount of companies. And whereas Y Combinator or 500 startups will invest in 100 a class, Capital Innovators only does five to six. So they give you a really hands-on kind of program. They bring in lots of subject matter experts and mentors. And when you graduate, because the portfolio is so small, you can email any of the mentors or anyone who's been through the program and they'll always make time for you because there's just not as many people who've been through it as some of your bigger accelerators. Well, Ben, man, this has been fun. Uh, for somebody that, number one, for somebody wanting to get into real estate, what would you say? So if you're in the situation where maybe you're not in a committed relationship, if you don't have kids, I would recommend that you house hack. And for those who don't know what house hacking is, it's buying a duplex or a fourplex. I would recommend a fourplex. You can get it on an owner occupied loan. That's three and a half percent down. I did that for my first property. I spent $8,000. I bought a property that was worth 220,000. I moved in, my tenants paid for all of the mortgage and enough to cover repairs. And I was able to buy it right and raise the rents enough that 11 months later I could sell the building for 285 and use that to fund some more significant investments. House hack? House hack. That's the That's uh, awesome. That's the term in the investing circles. <laughs> and it's and for on the flip side, people that want to start something right like actually they have an idea to do an app or software development or something that they think is going to be big time like how do they get started so if you're not technical and you're running a technical company you need to get a technical co-founder you're going to have a lot of problems unless you're the world's greatest salesman but if it's something that you can build think about what's the least amount of time i can spend to build a product and then go out and try and get people to pay for it And if you find that people want your product, then spend the time to improve. 
But if you can't get someone to pay you for what you've built, you need to seriously think about, is this an idea worth pursuing? Or what can I try next to get someone to pay for? And you should be thinking about what is the least amount of resources I can spend to get to the point where someone will pay me for what I've built. That's great stuff. Well, Ben, where can people find you? Um, I blog on Medium at Ben Mises. I'm on uh, Bigger Pockets. That's the real estate investing site. And I occasionally use my Twitter at Ben Mises, but mostly just my blog or uh, Bigger Pockets. Great. I followed you on Twitter today. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ben, it was a pleasure having you today. I uh, appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us and, and sharing your experiences with us. I think, it's, I think it will help someone who's on a similar journey that you're taking. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to have me on and getting to share my story. Ben, thanks a lot, man. This has been fun, and thank you guys for listening. Thanks for having me. For more episodes, visit innovationcity.co. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And if you're in St. Louis, visit us on a Thursday night. Details at vincafstl.org. And connect with us on social at We Are Slam or at Venture Cafe STL. Thanks for listening. This is where it all begins. So say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win.